So we come back again to go through these, these various elements of the devotion of the uh, flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And as I was praying beforehand, you know, it's, there are two, comp two effects, two purposes to what we're doing in this devotion, right? To put things in perspective, to blind Satan so that people can hear again and to create the greatest outpouring of grace since the incarnation. And again, that sounds so strange, such a superlative statement. But as I was praying beforehand, I was realizing we, we do live in a world of superlatives. As I've mentioned so many times, I'm not a believer in the good old days. You know, <laughs> World War II, <laughs> World War I, Great Depression. But if you think about it, today we are living in a world of the most, the worst, the greatest. You know, we are experiencing the greatest destruction of mankind in history in abortion. Nothing compares, nothing even comes close, Not, no war, no plague, no natural disaster. We are facing the greatest, most pervasive access to corrupting media that we have ever seen. You know, that virtually in any corner of the world, some six-year-old can be in their room with a phone streaming everything from hardcore pornography to mainstream entertainment that's bankrupt and, and feeding as assumptions very false perspectives about the world. Everywhere, it's never been so pervasive. And that's just in the last few years. You know, the power, the destructive power of war has never been greater than it is today. And our ability to pollute the planet and strangle ourselves has never been greater. So in so many ways, we already live in a superlative world. So it's no wonder that we should be experiencing the greatest attack of Satan ever. And in response to that, the greatest outpouring of grace since the Incarnation. So with that, now we go into the various elements of this devotion. What comprises it? What, what do we do? Uh, what are its parts? And the first topic we have in this tentacle to cover is fasting. It's ironic, at, at, at the joke, I won't embarrass anyone, but uh, so, someone had, I wasn't clear enough in communicating, and someone thought we were in the church tonight and didn't bring the food they were going to bring, and I thought, that's ironic, because guess what the first topic is? <laughs> so, so it was actually perfect. It was probably inspired, you know, just, just divine providence to, to uh, get us in the, in the mood here about what we're doing. So fasting is an important component of the devotion of the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, as are other forms of sacrificing ourselves for others, pouring ourselves out for others. So before we talk about this topic in particular, I wanted to set a little bit of context because sacrifices are indeed a big part of the devotion and key to both saving souls and opening ourselves to grace, to this great outpouring of grace. But we need to have a little bit of perspective. Perspective is critical. Otherwise, we can feel overwhelmed, we can feel constantly guilty, and we can be on a very wrong foundation. So often we feel inadequate and we start asking, you know, what do I have to do? And we have this checklist, right? We mentioned, you know, last week, Debbie, you mentioned there's this feeling of always not being enough, of having to run harder and faster. And we have this checklist, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do the other thing. And I ask, what do I have to do? And it's really not a generally Christian question, right? because it's incomplete. It's what do I have to do in order to, and then it's usually gain something, accomplish something. Everything from get to heaven, avoid hell, or ease my conscience. It's really a question that's rooted in the Old Covenant, right? The Old Covenant was given to a people who didn't have the Spirit of God. They could only think like humans. And so it was very much a covenant of you do this for me, I do that for you. God says you obey me and I'll make sure you have rain for your crops. You obey me, I'll protect your flocks. You obey me, I'll take care of your enemies. You do this for me, I do that for you. What do I have to do? That's an Old Covenant question. The New Covenant for us we have the spirit of God, just like we have the spirit of man. So we can think not only like a man, but we can think as God does. We can love as God does. And so if you look at the new covenant, it's not you do this for me and I do that for you, right? It's I will write my law on their hearts. I will forgive their sins. It's just God giving and giving and giving. And so a Christian never asks, what do I have to do? A Christian asks, what can I do? What can I do? It's not a matter of saying, am I doing enough? But it's, how much can I love? How far can I run with this? 
And that helps in a number of different ways. For one, it allows us to accommodate our true and real limitations without guilt. You know, if we're honestly saying, I'm loving all I can, I'm doing all I can, I'm honest with myself and this is what I can give, then that is fine. There's no need to beat up ourselves because we're failing on the checklist. Right? So we can accommodate this sense of our limitations without guilt. On the other hand, it also means that the sky is the limit in terms of what we can do. It's not, okay, I did these 10 things, so I guess that's good enough. I can now sit back. It's that God's challenge to us to say, how much can you be like me? Are you really willing to mount that cross? Are you really willing to give everything? You know, the sky is the limit when we say, how much can I love? How far can I run with this? And then finally, it continually builds both our honesty and our freedom. Right? Because when it's not a matter of what do I have to do, it's what can I do, we have to be honest with ourselves. Am I saying I can only do this much because I'm lazy? Because I really don't want to take that next step? Because I really don't want to give up that chocolate ice cream? You know, or because it really is the truth and maybe I need to scale back? We have to be honest, so it builds honesty. And again, how can you have any kind of relationship without honesty, including our relationship with God? And it builds freedom. You know, we're not riddled by guilt. We're not riddled by lists. We are free to love. It was interesting. St. Francis of Assisi did not want to write a rule for his order. He did so with great reluctance only when the friars kept asking him for one. All he wanted to say to his friars was, live the gospel. Just live the gospel. That's all you need. And if you do that and you're honest and you're loving, you'll do what needs to be done. You don't need a rule. And that's kind of life for us. And in fact, Jesus says this to Elizabeth right at the very beginning of the diary. She writes this conversation with her where he says, I don't force you. You have your free will only if you want it. It's not what do I have to do. It's what can I do? How much can I love? So let's talk about fasting for the flame of love devotion. First, some guidelines for fasting, the things that were told by, by Mary or by Jesus, that while fasting, we can eat bread abundantly and drink water, we're told. Right? We can eat bread abundantly and drink water. We can put salt on the bread, we can take vitamins, medicines, whatever is necessary to our condition. However, we should not enjoy it. Okay, so fasting involves you can have as much bread and water as you want. Okay, and just a, a, a tip you might want to follow if, if you're new to this is buy healthy bread. If you're eating that much bread, you probably don't want cheap sandwich bread because you'll eat a bunch of it and your stomach will just go. <laughs> you know? And it's actually surprisingly hard to find healthy bread. You may want to look up on the internet what it means and maybe there's enough of us. We'll talk to the local health food store or something, see if they'll order in some good bread for us. Uh, but, but eat healthy bread. Don't, don't, get, you know, don't eat a whole day worth of Wonder Bread. It just, oh, don't do that. <laughs> you know? Mary also says, whoever usually keeps the fast, it suffices to keep it until 6 o'clock p.m. In this case, they should recite this very day five decades of the rosary for the souls. Right? So you can eat as much bread and water as you want, and then after 6 you can have anything you want. This is really pretty wimpy fasting. <laughs> you know, it really is. You know, other, I remember being in, in, in another church, and fasting to us was derived from the Hebrew word of you know, cover your mouth. You didn't do anything. You didn't eat anything. You didn't drink anything. You didn't brush your teeth. Nothing went through your lips from sundown to sundown. Okay? And so, you know, really, bread as much as you want, water as much as you want, and 6 o'clock you can feast. It's, it's not really a huge sacrifice, but maybe for some of us it is. Now, in fact, truly, I, I joke about it a little bit, but we should realistically live within our limitations. Again, another famous story of St. Francis. Um, he and his friars were keeping a, a very rigorous fast one day, one night. And you can tell that there was one friar who was really struggling. And again, in those days, they didn't know about diabetes or other things that would make fasting very, very difficult. And St. Francis could sense the trouble, but the friar didn't want to break the fast. So St. Francis broke the fast intentionally, sat down, started eating, and invited the friar to join him so that the friar would not feel guilty breaking the fast because St. Francis could tell it was too much for him. 
You know, so live within our limitations. I had a very good friend, he's now, now deceased, very, very interesting man, uh, Fred. Fred was amazing. Fred was one of the five people at the time of the country with an IQ greater than 200. He was a man of great faith, and he was also a severe diabetic. And again, we were in this church where you fasted on the Day of Atonement, you know, from sundown to sundown with nothing through your mouth. And they said, you know, if you're a person of faith, you will fast, despite the fact you're a severe diabetic. So he did. Blew his kidneys. You know, so live within your limitations. But these are the guidelines for our fasts. Okay? And again, you know, it's, it's honesty with ourselves and it's wisdom. Wisdom tells us how to love, right? We love by grace, and then by the grace of wisdom, we know how to implement that love. So live within our limitations. But these are the guidelines for fasting. Let's talk about the specific fast, the Monday fast. Right? Elizabeth writes, Today is my fast day for the priestly souls. The Savior has asked me to fast each Monday on bread and water to free a priest's soul from purgatory. Although the fast weakens me, I can do my housework and help with the children. And then Jesus commends her. He says, since I see you have firm determination to which you are faithful even on feast days, I have prepared a happy event for you. Today from midnight on at every hour, the soul of a priest suffering in purgatory will be released. The Lord Jesus said this because at his request, I fast on bread and water on Monday. I do not skip the fast even when it is a feast day. I'm happy to keep the strict fast on Mondays because he promised that by fasting on Monday, one priestly soul would come into the divine presence. When I heard that one soul each hour would be freed, interesting, my soul was overwhelmed with the suffering that these souls still endure before coming into the divine presence. So she experiences the suffering of purgatory. She says, this suffering only lasted one or two minutes, but I almost collapsed from these sorrows. After communion, the Lord permitted me to experience the freeing of one soul. My feelings went from one extreme to another. After experiencing the depths of suffering, I was overwhelmed with the sublime joy of that soul who arrived in the divine presence. The state of my soul trembling from this rapture of graces made me feel freed for hours from the force of the earth's gravitational pull. So interesting, but we see more of what the Monday fast is about and how it was kept, or how it is kept. Again, she writes, This is a day of fast I am offering for the souls in purgatory, especially the souls of priests. He flooded, Jesus flooded my mind with the following words. Because you are appeasing my intense desire for souls, my little one, I will tell you about your reward. Thanks to your fast, from now on, the soul of a priest will be, released, will be freed from purgatory within eight days of his death. And anyone who observes this fast will obtain this grace for a suffering soul. These words were filled with such mercy and majesty that I cried because we can so effectively help the souls suffering in purgatory. My heart rejoiced when he told me of this, news and, of this new and great grace. And then the Lord Jesus asked me to write especially about how we can help souls. Jesus says, by observing the fast I ask for, priests will be freed from purgatory on the eighth day after their death. Now, it doesn't stop there. There is a wonderful promise attached to those of us who are willing to keep the Monday fast. Listen to this. Both the Lord Jesus and the Blessed Virgin took turns speaking. The Blessed Virgin's words sounded in my soul with firm but loving power. She asked the clergy, the consecrated religious, and the faithful Christians of the whole world to fast on bread and water on Mondays when they are able to do so. And Jesus says, the church and the whole world is in grave danger. Even with your strength, you cannot change this situation. The Most Holy Trinity alone can help you through the concerted intercession of the Most Blessed Virgin, all the angels, all the saints, and those souls whom you have freed from purgatory. According to the message of the Blessed Virgin, when priests observe the Monday fast, in all the holy masses that they celebrate that week, at the moment of consecration, 
they will free an innumerable number of souls from purgatory. When those persons consecrated to God and the faithful, us, right, keep the Monday fast, they will free a multitude of souls from purgatory each time they receive communion during that week, at the very moment they receive the holy body of our Lord Jesus Christ. So each time, if we've kept the Monday fast, we go and receive communion. We, receive, we release a multitude of souls into God's presence to join the struggle, but also for their sake, for their sake, to bring them the great joy that Elizabeth experienced. So we ask ourselves, I mean, this is amazing. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to fast on Mondays and then find an opportunity, a way to attend as many masses as we can for many reasons, we'll talk about those later. We have a separate cynical presentation on that. But also because at each one, we release a great deal of number, a great number of souls from purgatory. Something we don't see, we take by faith. And we have brought this great joy, this great relief to them. And this great joy to God, who receives them into heaven. That's the Monday fast. Now we have the Thursday and the Friday fasts. Oh, we're getting hungry already. <laughs> oh, it's too much. <laughs> While he was speaking to me, I got out a little, my little lunch. On Thursday and Friday, at the Lord's request, I eat only bread and water, and I offer it for the 12 priests. These are 12 priests that were supposed to receive the flame of love from Elizabeth to begin spreading it across the ocean and around the world. So I offer it for the 12 priests. We might say we would offer it for those leading the devotion to the flame of love and make reparation to the Lord. Meanwhile, the Lord sat in a spiritual way next to me and said, Oh, how this pleases me. So few times have I enjoyed participating in such an intimate banquet on bread and water. The souls that make reparation and faithfully follow my desires are so few. May our souls be in harmony in this way, our hands will gather in unity. Remember from the unity prayer, what are we gathering? Souls. Mary said, or Mary told her, my little one, Thursdays and Fridays should be considered as great days of grace. Those who offer reparation to my divine son on these days will receive a great grace. During the hours of reparation, the power of Satan will weaken to the degree that those making reparation pray for sinners. Nothing flashy is required. So there's a great deal that we can do by these fasts. All right, so what do we do? What are our next steps now that we have learned this part of the devotion? Oh, well, real simple. Begin fasting as you can. You know, begin fasting. Again, fasting is nothing new. Right? It's just we've kind of put it off to the side and said, all right, if I have to, it's Ash Wednesday, it's Good Friday, I guess. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> you know? But it's a regular part of life. You read throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament, of fasting and not just on two days out of the year. It's always been a path to grace. And now that path to grace is desperately needed to turn back this attack by Satan. As I said, there's not a lot new in this devotion. It's Mary and Jesus telling us to do the things we should have been doing all along because now we really need to. It's game on. All right, so fasting is nothing new. It's a path to grace that we need now. See fasting as a way to live the unity prayer. All right, we said we don't just pray it, we live it. It's not about you and me, Jesus, in my happy place. It's how do we together go to Calvary for salvation? How do we together sacrifice to gather souls? So see fasting as a way to live the unity prayer. Seeking deep union with Jesus by allowing him to pour out our lives for the salvation of others. Continue the flame of love, Hail Mary, and the rosary. Again, pouring out our time for others to blind Satan and release souls from purgatory through fasting, through mass, through prayer. Remember the fivefold sign of the cross, joining our minds to his suffering and offering our work, our sacrifices, and now our fasts, our masses and adoration for the blinding of Satan and the salvation of souls. So that's, that's the fast of the devotion to the flame of love. So again, it's really not a whole lot. It's bread and water as much as you want. After six o'clock, anything. And Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Any thoughts, questions before we go on to the next topic?
Yes, yeah, Debbie. Again, we'll, we'll get you a mic so we can hear. Mm -hmm. But I found that I had to, um, I had to prepare myself. It's, it's not, it's a, a, a more difficult, I think, mm -hmm. than this, but I did, I started doing this, and I found this difficult, too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I really want to do it, mm -hmm. but I, when I do it, I realize how much I really like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I eat, and eat what I want. <laughs> so it is a challenge, but I find that the, I don't know, Mm -hmm. um, keeps me constantly in conversation with the Lord because I don't want to. I really want to be eating what I want to eat, mm -hmm. and sometimes I don't even feel well from eating. Just I did the mm -hmm. bread and the water for one day last week, and I wasn't feeling too great doing it. Mm -hmm. When I did the twenty-one day fast, I had to. Well, I had to prepare myself because I first of all I wanted to make sure that I did it for the right reason, mm -hmm. and I think this is good because I think if we engage in it. We will be doing it for the right reason because of your leadership and you know what you're, you're helping us through this. Because fasting can be harmful mm -hmm. spiritually as well as physically if it's not done properly. Mm -hmm. And so I did get some spiritual direction. I had to prepare myself mentally for it and physically. Mm -hmm. I had to think about the food, like I'm thinking about where I'm going to get healthy bread because I did it the other day on regular bread. And yeah, it's awful. Whoa. So, you know, so there's things. I think there's a preparation of spiritual as well as a physical preparation that needs to be done. Because once, I find once I said, okay, it's start, <laughs> so I was ready for it. Yeah. And it was, it was difficult. I had to pray a lot, but it does keep you in communion with the Lord because it does get hard even coming to that last hour or so that you're doing it. So, anyway, that was my no, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it's, it's, it's true that again, just you know, from my life, just from where I've been, fasting was a regular part of my life. And so I, I take things for granted. So I'm really glad you brought that up. As I said at the beginning, work within your limitations. It also it depends on your age too. I find as I get older, you know, that doing completely without food and water gets a little harder. Um, you know, so live within your limitations. Start where you start and you know, see where you go. Again, it's not what do I have to do? It's what can I do? So thank you. Really glad you brought that up. Judy? I just have to laugh because Father Johnny used to tell us yes. he could go from one house to the other and not eat all day come Ash Wednesday. I remember that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, he's, 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 the food was not a problem, not a problem. And Ash Wednesday, oh, I am hungry. <laughs> yes. Just one quick question. If we're fasting and say like two or three o'clock, we feel like we can't go on anymore. Is it okay? I mean, would it count if we eat something <laughs> like a piece of cheese? <laughs> that's, that's, that's an interesting question. And I, I suppose that would be up to God. You know, so it's motivation for us. But just like St. Francis, right? Just be wise. You know, and it might be something that we have to get used to. If you've never, if you've never fasted before, it is quite a shock probably more mentally than physically. You know, it's really not a great deal physically. You have enough calories, you have enough food, but it's just that idea when we're so ingrained to, you know, three meals a day and, you know, that, that the idea, like Father Johnny, you know, the idea is probably more challenging than anything. But it's also true too, depending on our body chemistry, our age, our blood sugar levels, you may get to a point where it would be foolish not to. You know, you don't need to be driving your car and passing out. That would not be a good thing. You, know, you don't need to be at work and being a bad example because you're falling asleep at your desk. You know, so love most of all, and then be wise. Okay, so even love needs to be tempered by wisdom. I'd rather love foolishly than not love at all, but best to love wisely. And wisdom is that St. Francis of knowing when to do what out of love. And then whether God counts it or not, probably he's going to look at your heart. And we'll see some examples later on in other cynical presentations we have where that's exactly what happens to Elizabeth and Jesus and Mary dialogue with her and tell her, you know, yeah, we accept this. So, thank you. <laughs>